Hello and welcome back to my channel. I'm Paul Kalmans, naturopathic physician, former professor of naturopathic medicine at Portland, Oregon. And this is the 14th video in the Salutogenic Medicine series. And this is the second video on terrain medicine. So a little bit about this channel before I go on into the material for today, for those of you who might be new and joining. Um, so I'm a naturopathic physician as well as a uh, formerly licensed acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist in Oregon. I no longer practice acupuncture. Um, I'm currently in private practice uh, doing telemedicine, and um, I practice uh, mostly integrative uh, specialty medicine. And um, I've had a lot of experience in practicing in various integrative health clinics along with, alongside of uh, medical doctors and osteopaths and uh, acupuncturists and whatnot. And then I served as a system professor at the National University of um, Natural Medicine, NUNM, in Portland uh, for many years, where I was an instructor, clinical attending physician, a research mentor, and then I had additional training in evidence-based medicine, medical statistics, and clinical trials. Um, I also have further training in anthroposophically extended medicine, which I've discussed several times on this channel. Um, and then I have a deep interest in neuroendocrine immunology, as well as organ systems and how organs communicate using different peptides, which I'll be getting into. Um, also modulation of cell signaling pathways with natural products. And then a strong interest in morphogenesis and morphostasis. How do organs come about embryologically, but then also how do they maintain their forms and functions throughout life? Um, and a lot of this involves applications of integrated biophysics, looking at electrical charges in cells, as well as this concept of biophotons and electromagnetic fields and how that can be applied to medicine. And additionally, this growing area of academic quantum biology, how quantum effects are now being observed uh, in living organisms uh, in the cell and perhaps between cells and, and amongst groups of cells. Um, and then recently, I've kind of uh, delved into software engineering, data analytics, data science, machine learning, and AI, mostly to get um, understanding of how those can be applied to medicine. Um, for example, looking at clinical uh, case reports and, and collecting information there, but also in research and um, how we can bring together all the new genomic, proteomic, metabolomic data and look at patterns within that data using those tools. Um, the purpose of this channel really is to try to expand our current biomedical disease model towards a model of health, as I've discussed many times, what I've been calling the salutogenic model of health. And um, this is also hopefully to inspire new approaches to chronic disease, which I feel are not being that well addressed within the current model. Um, also, um, I'm hoping to help understand how natural therapeutics can be used in novel ways, maybe exploring novel pharmacologic mechanisms, and then provide an integrated model for traditional medicine. So there's a lot of different traditional medicines, Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, et cetera, um, but they all have fairly disparate systems of, of training and teaching. Uh, in my own experience over the years, they have a lot of commonalities which can be brought together with more modern approaches such as um, anthroposophically extended medicine. And my hope is to develop a more comprehensive model that would include all of them so that they're not talked about as disparate and separate things, and that this model can be integrated with biomedicine. And along this, I wanna challenge maybe some of the dogmas and beliefs of integrative medicine in my own profession, naturopathic medicine. I think there's a lot of potential room for updating of concepts which uh, are not being, I, I feel, not being well explored right now. So that's a little bit about the channel uh, for those of you just joining in. Uh, if you like these videos, please share and like the videos and then subscribe to the channel. So <clears throat> I started to hold this the series on the idea of medical paradigms. Paradigm really is our conceptual models plus our methods we use to gather data. And our conceptual models and the thinking we use in those models really determines what we see ultimately, what we can know. Um, so when we talk about, for example, science and science-based medicine or biomedicine is the primary approach to medicine, that is one way of seeing, one way of knowing, which has a, a stellar track record in many areas, but again, is reaching limits in others. And uh, my argument is that we can expand our ways of knowing, ways of thinking, to include, to broaden this a bit, to extend biomedicine, not replace it, but to extend it into a different direction. So I reviewed in the first few videos the biomedical paradigm, which is based really on uh, several so-called isms, materialism, the idea that only matter, molecules, and genes, and physical energies, like electromagnetic energies involved in chemistry, are real. 
and the human life processes, consciousness processes, or what we might call soul, and then higher mind or spiritual processes emerge from matter. So it's sort of a bottom up way of thinking. Um, this way, this way of thinking also uses reductionism. So the whole essentially is thought to emerge from the parts, from the molecules and the genes. So the whole is essentially the sum of the parts. If we can understand all the different molecular machinery, uh, then we can understand these higher order processes. Uh, that's the idea in the biomedical paradigm. Um, and so there's a strong focus on single cellular and subcellular mechanisms. Um, the um, classic kind of um, approach to looking at how these molecules fit together is using classical mechanisms and classical causation. Um, and this would be looking at um, gene expression, molecular signaling pathways, metabolic pathways, and whatnot. And then using the so-called lock and key models in pharmacology, where a molecule has to bind to a physical receptor to activate it, and then triggers a cell response. So these are the ways of thinking that anyone who studied medicine would be well familiar with. The idea of disease in the biomedical paradigm is that, first of all, it's a distinct entity with specific signs and symptoms, and there's a focus largely on cellular pathology. The disease starts in the cells and in the genes and whatnot, um, and that usually physical causes are the cause of disease, so some sort of uh, microbe or toxin or a gene defect or radiation, etc., is what is, uh, or vitamin deficiency, these are all potential causes of disease. And then we study the so-called pathophysiological mechanisms, and the treatment consists of trying to fix or suppress those mechanisms that have gone awry. Uh, and this is the so-called allopathic approach. And this has really, a, at the root, a sort of war-like metaphor. We fight disease. There's a war on cancer and so forth. So that is this um, idea that disease is some sort of separate entity from us and that it must be targeted that way. Biomedical thinking, as I've discussed, is very quantitative and analytical. It's substance-based, so we try to reduce everything to molecules and look at MOAs, mechanisms of action. It's statistically based, so we have all this data now, and we have to use statistics to sort of put it together and look at meaningful patterns uh, within that data. It's very mechanistic in how these different parts fit together, almost like billiard balls hitting one another or Lego blocks stacking on one another. That's how we think about how these biomolecules work. And there's a strong focus on anatomy and physical structures. So in medicine, you know, we do imaging and we look at biomarkers, physical things, to see why we're sick. And if you, you know, healthcare providers who work with a lot of chronic care realize that I have come to experience that many of the diseases people suffer from or illnesses they're complaining, they're reporting really don't show up on our current testing or imaging. Um, and so that leaves big questions. Well, what are we going to do in, in those cases? Um, there's a strong focus in biomedical thinking on what we might call the hardware of the cell. And that's the molecules and genes again. And then that these from a, through a bottom up method of causation, uh, you know, essentially contribute to the other layers of, uh, of organization within us. The strengths, of course, are that it's quantitative, measurable, and we can use evidence-based techniques, statistics, clinical trials, and whatnot uh, that we can measure. Um, and um, so that is a, a strong, uh, you know, strength. Uh, I won't go into discussion about the limits of evidence-based medicine and the, you know, unfortunate, um, you know, uh, problems with, uh, you know, clinical trials and, and so forth. So I won't, I won't discuss that here. Um, other strengths of biomedical paradigm would be, you know, treatment of acute disease, trauma, surgery, got to replace hardware or parts. Uh, also medical diagnostics and imaging when there's physical lesions that have to be addressed. Um, all these things are strengths of the biomedical way of thinking. The weaknesses would be more chronic disease and especially what we may call functional disease, where really there are no biomarkers that we typically can measure, but, but patients report feeling poorly. Um, uh, there's also this tendency in biomedicine to over-specialize. So there are experts in the heart and the foot and the liver, but there's very little integration amongst those providers. So patients are often sent around for all these different specialists um, and they receive medications and treatments from each, but there's no essential integration of all those together. Uh, it's expensive as we're seeing, you know, America is a good example of a strong biomedical tradition and we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world amongst all industrialized nations with unfortunately the worst outcomes of all the nations. So that's very interesting that, um, you know, this kind of expensive over-specialized medicine isn't necessarily contributing to better outcomes. Uh, we might say also there's a soulless aspect to medicine. It's more machine-like and robotic. Um, and, um, 
there's also, you know, this uh, unfortunate tendency towards iatrogenic or medicine-induced diseases within uh, the biomedical thinking. Now, I, I've argued that so-called um, integrative medicine, such as functional medicine or modern naturopathy and so forth, these are emerging as sort of responses to the biomedical paradigm. Uh, and they are looking at more disease mechanisms. Uh, so, for example, they discuss things like antioxidants, for example, and uh, the use of maybe less toxic and more natural products, uh, such as vitamins and minerals and herbals and whatnot. So there's a big trend towards IV vitamins and pushing nutrition and this different thing. Um, you know, I would argue that the although these these can address for some patients areas that are not being addressed by the biomedical paradigm. You know, if a patient actually actually has a nutritional deficiency and whatnot, uh, that's that's true. Um, but the the way of thinking used in these more modern integrative medicines is really just an extension of the biomedical paradigm. And interestingly, a lot of the discussion about vitamins and whatnot is based more on hypothesis uh, rather than actual clinical trials and, and data. So we're finding, for example, a lot of vitamin studies are not very positive at all, in fact, showing some negative effects for different vitamin supplements, uh, including antioxidants, huge discussion there, which I can create a video on. Um, and we have to understand that correlation is not the same as causation. So just having low vitamin D, low uh, HDL or these different things don't correlate necessarily with health outcomes. And uh, just replacing those things won't necessarily give us the clinical benefits that we uh, are hoping for. Um, so those are some of the weaknesses in the integrated model. So my idea here is to try to see well, what, we, what can we do to take that even further. So what I've been proposing here is the so-called salutogenic paradigm. Um, which is based on some different premises, which can be challenging, I think, for modern thinkers. And um, this is why a lot of traditional medicines, which are based in these ways of thinking, tend to be looked at with some degree of skepticism. We say they're non-scientific because they're not quantitative, measurable, not based on materialistic assumptions, um, which, um, you know, I've argued that we can have non-materialistic assumptions and still create hypotheses that can be tested through the methods of science. And so these are not necessarily anti-scientific, but they broaden, they're outside the current discussion and the paradigm of biomedicine. So one of the uh, important uh, things to realize is, in the pseudogenic paradigm, is that the instead of materialism, there's this belief in what we might call idealism, or panpsychism, or a multidimensional view of reality, that there are higher levels, dimensions of reality and that the human being um, has uh, activities that drive from these various dimensions. So we might call there's a sensory world, the world we're familiar with, uh, that we can measure and, and weigh and, and so forth, and the more, more supersensory worlds of, for example, feeling and thought and more life activities which are more subtle. Um, so life, consciousness, soul, and then higher mind or spirit are realities in and of themselves. They don't just emerge from matter, they actually guide the matter into the final forms that we see in living organisms and their functions. And this happens through what I've been arguing, fields, specifically morphic fields. And this is after the biologist Rupert Sheldrake, but many others have discussed this idea of morphic fields. There are morphic fields at the levels of physiology, the so-called morphogenetic fields, but then there are also behavioral fields, mental fields, and these fields have realities, and we can connect through them through resonance and uh, attune to them. Um, for example, attune to another person's thoughts or feelings, and but these require different modes of cognition. We can't use the analytical thinking like we use in biomedicine to attune to those modes, but we can always go back to analytical thinking to test hypotheses and so forth. So it's not that we throw out analytical thinking, it's that we expand beyond it. Um, the other idea of pseudogenic paradigm instead of reductionism, we have holism. So the whole is not equal to the sum of the parts. And these higher levels of organization, the life morphogenetic fields and the soul fields and the spirit fields, essentially guide the parts, the molecules and the genes, guide gene expression. And I talked about, for example, they could be guiding the bioelectrical states of cells, um, and that could be guiding the, the chemistry and the gene expression of the cell. Um, the salutogenic paradigm also argues that we have non-classical mechanisms of causation in the body. So instead of this linear one molecule bumping into another effect, basically, we can have field-like interactions. Uh, and this has the role of the uh, quant potential quantum mechanisms, for example, non-locality, resonance transfer of information, and so forth. <clears throat> so um, 
Syllogenic paradigms would be more uh, open to exploring those sorts of uh, methods. And the syllogenic paradigm disease um, is not really the focus. Really, there's a focus more on health, supporting normal, more normal physi uh, physiology and homeostasis, and seeing how disease essentially is a, um, uh, a uh, unfortunate disturbance of normal physiology. So if we can correct the physiology, um, then we can correct the disease process. So disease is not something that needs to be fought. Um, it's really something that needs to be tended to in a way, almost like using the metaphor of gardening or tuning a musical instrument. When we're out of tune, then we have disease. It's not the disease is some separate entity that we have to fight and get rid of. It's more that has to, we have to integrate something back into our, into our whole. Uh, and this would require supporting the fields and their activities through specifically, and I'm going to be getting into this, the glands and the organs of the body. Um, so salutogenic thinking is more, in addition to the quantitative methods, more qualitative, also more synthetic versus analytical. Uh, and I've discussed in several places this idea from the Austrian philosopher Rudolf Steiner of how we can expand intellect uh, into imaginative processes, inspiration, and intuition, intuition intuitive activities. Um, and so this focuses more, these methods of cognition focus more on processes and functions versus substances. Uh, and they, we can say they focus more on the software of the body. And there is, instead of a bottom-up causation from the level of genes and molecules, a top-down causation from the fields into matter. So the strengths are we can reveal more gestalt patterns. How are all these systems integrated and connecting together? And that might give us new insights into chronic disease, uh, especially more functional and mental emotional disorders. Um, there's more of a tendency in the salutogenic models towards holism versus specialization. So instead of having a you know, specialist, we look at generalists that can bring all the pieces together and look at the integrative whole. The cost tends to be lower, uh, and some studies have actually shown in, for example, naturopathic therapies and whatnot, the cost for treating low back pain, for instance, is lower than the conventional standards um, through these different types of methods. Um, in this, the salutogenic thinking addresses more body, soul, and spirit. So it puts the human being, the soul and spiritual aspects back into uh, medicine instead of seeing them as something separate and isolated. Um, generally, the salutogenic models emphasize more low-dose therapies that are generally less toxic. The weaknesses are the evidence base is very weak at this point because we haven't been really studying a salutogenic approach that long. There are no clear models. I've mentioned that each of these different traditional medicines has their own model, which this few people integrate them together. But having studied several of these models through the years myself, I find they do have a lot of commonalities and we can start maybe putting that together into a common model. Uh, there's unfortunately a tendency within the different traditional medicines towards what I might call dogmatic thinking. There's no willingness to explore and question and change. So people just accept the beliefs or you know take it or leave it kind of mentality. And I don't think that's really conducive to the evolution of these different disciplines, especially when it comes to integrating more modern findings from biomedicine. Um, this, these also, you know, salutogenic models also tend to require, especially developing imaginative, inspirative, and intuitive cognition, uh, a lot of inner training, a lot of inner development, which is difficult. And this is currently outside the medical system, including reimbursement. So, you know, the whole mo medical model is based on pathology and, and treating disease, not on supporting wellness. So insurance companies and whatnot generally do not support uh, these. And so it's very difficult for providers who want to go in this direction to make a living. Um, and um, so that I think is something that can be addressed just maybe through, you know, greater awareness as well as doing clinical trials to show that these methods may actually save money improve health more. And so I think then we would want to reimburse them. Um, again, this idea of pseudogenesis focuses on conditions of health, not disease. And I mentioned it was coined by the uh, Israeli-American sociologist, Aaron Antonovsky, in the late 1970s. Um, examples traditionally of pseudogenic medicine would be classical Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, uh, ancient Greek Persian medicine, which is currently called Unani medicine, and then anthroposophically extended medicine and traditional naturopathy, not modern naturopathy. It's very interesting how there's been a shift in thinking in the naturopathic field, much more towards biomedicine and away from more salutogenic models. Now, again, I think I might lose a lot of followers saying that, but um, that has been my observation being a professor for 
for nearly 20 years, you know, in, and, and teaching a lot of these different things, I have seen a dramatic shift away from that way of thinking. Again, that's not to say that biomedical models are incorrect. It's more that we can, we can expand them uh, with these new ways of thinking. So uh, one of the central premises of the salutogenic way of thinking is that we have distinct levels of organization, or what I'm referring to as fields, sort of morphic fields, which guide the matter, the genes, and the molecular biology at the cell level. Um, and uh, these fields can be perceived using these different modes of cognition, and they work down into the matter. And, and organize it. So they work more through a top-down causation versus the bottom-up causation that we study typically in biomedicine. So the first level of organization would be the actual solid or mineral organization. We might call this the mineral body. Um, and that's our physical structure and anatomy down to the level of molecules and genes. So what can be measured, what can what we see as matter essentially. And we study these through molecular mechanisms. But what's interesting is when you study these things, you have to essentially destroy the organism where they occur. We have to kill the organism and then tear it apart into these pieces. And then through our intellectual mechanisms, we piece it back together again. So essentially what is physical in the body, and, and this can be perceived when we study embryology, what forms as matter actually precipitates out of the dynamic uh, activities within the fluid. So even the human heart is really a congealing of cells that are in a fluid streaming in the embryo, uh, and they start to settle out around different uh, flow forms, and those, flow, those where it settles out forms the chambers of the heart, for instance, and the blood vessels. So what is solid in the body um, began as a fluid, and what is, has deposited as solid is on the way towards what we might call death. So our physical anatomy and structures are towards the pole of death, they're dying. And the classic place where we can see the physical structure is in the corpse. And that's the first thing medical students are exposed to is, is dissecting a corpse. Um, and so we start with what we might call death-like thinking in the biomedical uh, paradigm. Um, and this is of course, uh, it has advantages because we can weigh and measure uh, this, uh, this physical level organization. But our life activities really begin, as I've discussed, in the fluids. So our physiology, including metabolism, repair, regeneration, growth, and so forth, really begins in the fluids. And of course, we look at different growth factors and hormones matter as carrying those activities, but really these are all dissolved within the fluids and they change the dynamics of the fluids. Um, and we can think of this whole body working to the fluid as a sort of morphogenetic field, um, what Rudolf Steiner and the theosophists call the etheric body or etheric field. Um, and again, this works through our hormones and growth factors and even cytokines secreted by different organs. These are small peptides, small proteins. Um, and here, you know, we have a new uh, advances in biomedicine looking at the water within the cells in the extracellular spaces and finding that it's highly organized, highly structured. And I mentioned the work of Gerald Pollack, for example, um, and that this water can hold charges and that ch these charges can supply our biochemistry with energy. And so the water participates in a way we never imagined in biochemical processes. Um, this structured water also is negentropic. It opposes the forces of entropy, which we have in the mineral world. This is more entropy-like. Um, and these processes in the fluid are what traditional medicines refer to as vital processes. And I've discussed how maybe many of these work through novel, non-classical or quantum mechanisms. Uh, for example, the resonance transfer of information through water. Um, and this could be what traditional medicines were referring to as the flow of qi and so forth um, in Chinese medicine, for instance. Uh, and this way of thinking to understand the fluid body requires that we use a more qualitative, uh, synthetic or imaginative type of cognition. Now superimposed upon our plant body and our mineral body, we have what we might call the animal body or the body that works through gases, and I've discussed in several places, uh, inner light as well. And it's related to our consciousness, our consciousness organization. So this would be our um, consciousness processes, our psychology and our soul, uh, and that includes sensation, instinct, feeling, subconscious thinking patterns. We might say archetypes of feelings. These are all morphic behavioral patterns in the field of our consciousness field. 
um, and uh, that biophotons may be a way through neurons, especially through uh, microtubules of the neurons, might be a way of communication within this body. So it's used, and, and light, of course, uses quantum mechanisms, non -classic, not, it's not classical. And this requires more of a feeling inspirative thinking to perceive the, uh, and to, to know the gas uh, consciousness body. Uh, and many have described this as more of a body of light. This is an aspect of what's called the human aura. And within that, there's all sorts of differentiated organs like the chakras, but even each organ itself lights up in a different way. Um, and it's very interesting. For example, in Chinese medicine, there's this concept called the Ming Men, uh, or it translates as the bright gate, an area around the kidneys. Well, it's interesting if you look anatomically there, you find heavy nerve bundles going into the kidneys and the adrenals. And if we think of light being associated with these nerve activities, there would be an inspirative consciousness in inner light observable there. So many of these early classics, I would argue, were, were written down when people were able to uh, use these these different states of cognition which we have over the last several hundred years in the west at least lost um, this gas like consciousness body or animal body is what uh, rudolf steiner and the theosophists called the astral body and again has a strong connection with the nerve activities and then finally there is what we might call the human aspect of us or human archetype which works through warmth and this allows for not just consciousness but also self-awareness self-introspection we can question our instincts. We can find new solutions that maybe nature hasn't found. Uh, we can bring new insight. Now, of course, this allows for the capacity also of what we might call evil in the sense that we go against the natural processes and we can harm and, and so forth. Um, and, uh, but this brings up the whole aspect of morality um, as well as creativity and love. So these, uh, this level of organization, the warmth organization, um, could be thought of again as a type of morphogenetic field, more of a mental morphogenetic field, and connection to not just ourself, but our meta self and spirit, you know, others. See that we all actually share this similar, we're all immersed in this similar field of warmth, and we're all like little drops that come out of that warmth. And this requires more of an intuitive thinking, or what some have called the thinking with the heart, more of a direct knowing not based on the intellect. Uh, and this is what Steiner and the Theosophists call the ego eye body, uh, and it works primarily through the circulatory activities and the immune activities. So these are, you know, four levels of distinct organization within the human being that uh, is kind of as a summary of what I've gone over in previous lectures. Now, this is where, you know, this is going to be very speculative here, and I'm just kind of throwing this out here maybe to just, you know, uh, spark some thought or some uh, creative hypotheses. Uh, but the idea that these different fields actually emerge from different types of space. And um, this is, again, what's very difficult to understand about traditional medicines. So I think implicit in Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, even the alchemical traditions of the West, is this idea of higher dimensional spaces and that we are coming, parts of us come from those different dimensions. In fact, what we might call our eye or human self, that aspect that comes out of warmth, we might argue comes out of a specific space, uh, which we might call the mental archetypal space. Uh, this is the space that Plato referred to as the archetypal space, for example. Uh, in Chinese medicine, this, these higher dimensional spaces were referred to as Tian or heaven. And Shen is one aspect that comes out of that, our sense of self, our spirit self in a way. Um, the, there's a lower space we might call, you know, that's wrapped uh, within that mental archetypal space, and that is what we might call the astral psychic space or the dream world. Um, and this is where the astral field emerges from. Um, and then there's a sort of interface between that dream world and our, our usual physical three-dimensional space. Uh, and that would be the etheric space working through time. So life activities unfold in time, in rhythms. Very difficult to grasp, but the idea, if you look at a plant, the plant you see in front of you is actually forming through time. You have to really look at snapshots of that over time to get a sense of the whole plant that's emerging in the physical world. It's as if these dimensions of space are coming into the physical world through the plant. We can say the same thing about the human uh, embryo, for instance. Um, so far, in uh, up to the end of the 1800s, physics study, the physical body and the, and the fields, and that would be our classic physical fields like electromagnetic and gravity fields. But now we have the idea of quantum fields, 
Uh, I mentioned the um, physicist David Bohm, who had this idea of the implicate order uh, versus the classical space, which is the explicate order, um, and that these spaces are all within the implicate order. And we describe them in physics using complex number spaces or so-called Hilbert spaces, for example. Uh, I won't go into that here, but that's just a you know, one way of maybe thinking about this. Back to Chinese medicine, the physical body and field are part of what they called Earth or D, um, and that the uh, union of the physical or the etheric fields with the physical uh, would be what is called Jing in Chinese medicine, and the union of the astral field with the etheric field is the Qi. And essentially, this is where the formative forces that form the etheric, which then form the physical, arise from. Uh, you know, it's interesting in the human being, of course, the physical field, the physical matter that deposits is always being reabsorbed back into the fluid and then redeposited. So there's a constant oscillation. Similarly, with the etheric and the astral, there's an oscillation. And then with the astral and the mental, there's an oscillation. So, for example, if one in meditative states enters into more the warmth body this way and um, this through intuitive cognition, and just simply observes non-judgmentally and neutrally the patterns within the astral field, you essentially can dissolve them back into warmth. And that frees up astral energies, which then frees up etheric energies, and that results in a change in physiology. So this is how, through these more subtle states of the fluid, the gas, and the warmth, we can affect the solid of the body itself. So there's some hypotheses about the idea of morphic fields, which you can read about more from uh, Rupert Sheldrake in his uh, A New Science of Life that he published back originally in the 1980s and recently updated. Now, one area that's, I think, important because you can talk about fields and whatnot, and all this is very separate from the world of genes and molecules that we typically study in medicine. Um, you know, an interesting idea from the alchemical traditions, but this also comes strongly from Rudolf Steiner and the anthroposophic tradition. And a beautiful sort of summary of these ideas is from Rudolf Hauschka, who was a chemist inspired by Rudolf Steiner, um, who wrote a book called The Nature of Substance, Spirit and Matter. And uh, basically, you know, this, this approach argues that these fields work through certain chemical elements. So, for example, the physical body and field really works through carbon, uh, silica, and uh, calcium, silicon and silicon dioxide. So carbon, silica, calcium, these uh, really are carriers, you might say, of the physical structures of the body, the calcium in the bone, the silica in our sensory organs and skin in our hair, and then the carbon, which forms the backbones of all of our organic molecules. That's more the earth aspect or the solid aspect. And then we have our oxygen processes. Water itself by molecular weight is mostly oxygen. So we think of oxygen with the air, but interestingly, the air is mostly nitrogen. Um, and I'd say the true oxy oxygen stuff is water. And oxygen, of course, is involved in all these different life-giving chemical reactions, uh, which the etheric body can work through. There's also some interesting magnetic properties to oxygen, which are just being studied now in medicine, and this connection, maybe there's sort of a mag magnetism that's involved within these uh, chemical reactions that oxygen is able to carry. Uh, also, potassium and magnesium increase the activities of the etheric life plant body. If you break a plant down into its minerals, it's primarily potassium. So if you burn wood, you get all the ash, which is primarily potassium carbonate um, in, your, in your fireplace. Um, the astral body or field works through nitrogen, which again is the primary uh, element in the air, but also we now have, for example, carbohydrates are mostly oxygen and carbon, um, but then in, with, nit with hydrogen. And then we have with uh, proteins, we now add nitrogen in to the amino acids. And so now proteins unite carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Um, and this allows more movement. This allows for enzyme activity and structure and whatnot. You might say that's an image of these astral forces uh, coming in. But also through sodium, very important for the electrolyte in the nervous system, and chloride, so these carry astral activities. And then finally, um, the warmth processes can be thought of as being carried through hydrogen, but also elements like phosphorus, Phosphorus is hugely involved in cell signaling, all these so-called kinases, which are enzymes which attach phosphate groups to different uh, proteins, activate cell signaling processes. We store energy in phosphorus, adenosine triphosphate, 
So extremely important element in human physiology, even though we don't need a whole lot of it in the body. And then sulfur as well, very important for protein folding and so forth. So these um, chemical elements we might think of as carrying these four different fields and activities of the fields right down into the chemistry. And we can you know, expand on the list, which Hauska does, and I'll, I can talk more about in future lectures, uh, looking at the metals and the metalloids like arsenic and antimony, uh, but even metals like gold and uh, iron and copper and so forth all have uh, some physiologic activities. And they are carriers for different aspects of these different bodies. So that is how we can start to connect, for example, the different fields with matter itself. Now, this second lecture in the series on trained medicine here is all about cellular terrain. So again, in biomedicine, we tend to focus on the cells and what happens at the cell level. And even in integrative uh, medicines today, there's a lot of talk about cell level activities, um, cellular nutrition and, and cellular pathology and so forth. But more and more, the uh, idea is emerging in biomedicine but it's, all, it's an idea that's already firmly rooted in traditional medicines, that the extracellular environment, what happens outside the cells, really determines what happens inside the cell. And I mentioned the work of Michael Levin at Tufts with the idea that the electrical charges at the, at the cell membranes really determine gene expression and cell activities and morphogenesis, how cells form together into different organs and structures, um, but that these electrical charges are very much determined by the extracellular environment. And so we might call these factors epigenetic, uh, above the genome, uh, that are again guiding uh, genomic expression. <clears throat> Um, there's an interesting idea in cancer. So most cancer research right now is based on the so-called somatic mutation theory, that we have gene mutations and that eventually causes the cell to trigger into a pro-growth mode and it takes off the breaks on cell growth. So cells just start to grow. The, there's an alternative model that I've referenced down below here called the tissue organization field theory, uh, which argues it's the environment of the cell really that's most important. And that when the environment becomes ill, from toxic depositions or, or nutrient deficiencies or a host of other factors, um, then the cells start to grow uncontrollably. So it's the environment which actually keeps the cell in check. And what I'm arguing here is that part of the environment, really this environment is determined by the interaction of the four bodies I've discussed. So we would say that cancer really in this example, is a case of the four bodies not regulating the extracellular environment properly, and therefore the cells start to lose their, um, their controls, so they start to grow uncontrolled. And this brings up the idea of cellular terrain, that the total activities of the extracellular matrix guide cell function. So the premise here is a disease happens because of an imbalanced terrain, not primarily because of a cell problem. So the cells really are secondary in a salutogenic way of thinking. Um, and then we can start to look at different terrain dysfunctions. <clears throat> now, one person who studied this in great detail was uh, uh, Alfred Pischinger, who wrote uh, the book, Extracellular Matrix and Ground Regulation, which is still in print. And then um, this is also the basis of what's called bioregulatory medicine, which you can read about as well. But basically this looks at the ECM, which of course is composed of connective tissue. We call this the stroma. And we can say that's an aspect of the physical body. So this collagen, what are called proteoglycans and whatnot. And these sop up water like a sponge and they form a gel and they form these uh, easy water or structured water structures. So we have the fluids also within the stromal space. Um, but then we have uh, coming into that stromal space, capillaries, arterioles carrying blood in, and venules bringing blood out and the capillaries in between them. And they're bringing in oxygen and nutrients like vitamins and amino acids and fatty acids and whatnot, the various electrolytes, as well as the hormones from your classic endocrine glands, but also hormones and signaling factors from your organs. And this is very important. And this is just a, a very new area of research. How, for example, the liver secretes peptides called the dip, uh, hepatokines, which can influence your muscle metabolism, your fat metabolism, your skin, your brain, your heart. And so organs are all communicating with each other through these different things. And I mentioned in an earlier video that we can look at the cells and connective tissue as units and ask what are the fundamental units of cells and connective tissue? And those are the organs. They're all differentiated by distinct fascia. 
um, or connective tissue sheaths. And so these are the units of life, not so much the cells. Um, and so a sluogenic model would look more at the organ and the gland level for dysfunction rather at the cellular level and see that all the cells, for example, in an organ like the liver are, need to be functioning coherently together uh, for there to be um, health. And when those cells start to malfunction because of problems in the terrain of that organ, um, then we can start to see pathologies. So that's one thing is the capillaries, which bring in warmth as well, as well as cytokines, immune molecules. Say so this is an aspect of the ego eye body. Um, the venules, of course, drain out the carbon dioxide and waste uh, and then various hormones and peptides. And then larger proteins go through the lymphatic system. And so this fluid system, all the different dissolved nutrients and growth factors and whatnot can be conceived of as part of the etheric body. And then we have finally in the extracellular matrix nerves, and these are usually autonomic nerves, sympathetic and or parasympathetic. Um, and they are either motor, they're carrying motor impulses, the so-called efferent nerves, um, and they secrete different neurotransmitters possibly biophotons through their microtubules. And then we have the afferent sensory nerves carrying information back. For example, the vagus nerve, which many people have heard about, innervates the gut. It provides a motor stimulation to the butt, gut to stimulate uh, stomach acid secretion and peristalsis and whatnot. But also it brings 80% of those vagal fibers are sensory and they bring information back to the brain to tell the brain what's going on in the gut. And this is the so-called gut brain connection or one aspect of that. Um, so the nerves carry this information, mostly formative information for how to form the different structures and activities. And this is an aspect of the astral body. So all four bodies play into the extracellular terrain. And um, this is, I think, the key to salutogenic medicine, but also traditional medicines, which are really diving into this in depth. Now, we can start to look at of course, all the individual neurotransmitters and cytokines and hormones, and it becomes, you know, a giant mess. There's just hundreds of these different small molecules, and it's fascinating to explore them. And so far, biomedicine has, you know, you know, different therapies look at individual uh, signaling pathways and whatnot. But we can also back up and look at more of a gestalt view of the terrain of the extracellular matrix and look at the not so much substances there, but what are the actual activities going on? And this is again using more imaginative or qualitative thinking. And this is creating more of a qualitative versus a quantitative physiology. Um, so we can look at these Gestalt processes, which ultimately are carried, and this is gonna be uh, where I'll go further in this, carried by things like thyroid hormone and adrenal hormones and whatnot. Um, but ultimately we can step back and look at this as a whole. And we find that there are at least four distinct areas of activity, again, corresponding to those different fields. So one, we of course have the metabolic activity uh, within the, uh, the, the tissues. And so this would be, you know, how much blood comes in, how much oxygen, how much nutrients are available for your mitochondria to make energy and heat. Um, and this really, if we use more imaginative thinking in terms of polarity thinking, we can say that the different states of the metabolic activity could be hot in excess or they could be cold. So warming and cooling would be the two qualitative aspects of that. So we can think of tissues that are very swollen and inflamed, like an acute inflammation is hot. Tissues that are more inactive receive poor circulation, poor metabolism as cold. Um, and in Chinese medicine, this is referred to as the yang activity. Uh, for those of you in the Chinese medicine field. So, you know, this would be yang excess, for example, and yang deficiency, the examples there. And we can correlate colors with these to make it a little bit more easy to visualize. And in fact, the way to think about this is how, you know, we, we're really talking here at the physiologic level about the etheric field in general, but how all the four bodies project into the etheric field. So if we think of the etheric field as having different vibrational states, corresponding perhaps to different colors, um, we can think of these physiologic states as different color states in the etheric field. And essentially, this is a map of what the ancient Greeks called the vis medicatrix naturae, which is discussed in naturopathy, but I've never in my years of teaching heard anyone discuss it at this level. Um, and I don't think most naturopaths are, are exposed to this way of training today. Um, so you know, this idea of these tissue processes explored more qualitatively can, can yield some important clinical insights. 
Um, so metabolic activity would be one. We also have the um, blood circulatory activity, um, and that can bring in, again, by bringing more oxygen and whatnot, more warmth uh, into the tissues. And then at the other end, more the venous drainage, lymphatic drainage can, can drain out fluids and, and create the right balance of fluids there. Um, then we have the autonomic nerve activity, and we can think of uh, the autonomic nerves being overactive in a tissue. For example, the vagus is overactive in the stomach. We have too much stomach acid secretion. We can get nausea. We can get too much peristalsis, diarrhea, that sort of thing. And then an underactive autonomic stimulation would result in the opposite, more um, what we call gastroparesis and lack of peristalsis, lack of stomach acid, and so forth. So those uh, can be, and that's another a level of activity. And that's what in Chinese medicine is referred to as the qi, um, the qi activities. Uh, I'm relating that here to the nerves. And then finally, the tissue fluids themselves, how much fluid is in the tissue, the so-called yin in Chinese medicine. We can have very damp tissues, a lot of fluid, for example, edematous fluid, or maybe gooey structured water, which is absorbing toxins and whatnot uh, within the ECM. And then we can have more of a dry tissue uh, where we have mineral deposits, we have lack of fluids in that tissue and so forth. So these would be the various tissue states, and this is a map of the ECM activities. We can discuss this uh, for the whole body as a whole, so the whole human being can be thought of this, and we can look at the idea of different temperaments. Everyone has a certain state of these different activities, and there are four distinct temperaments that have been discussed in the Western tradition, for example, and I can go into that in a future lecture. So that would be one way of looking at it. But another, I think, more practical way is to say that each organ tissue can have its own terrain. Um, and uh, when we begin to look at organs like the liver or the kidneys, say that there is a when we talk about supporting the liver, we have to think about the different ter possible terrain states of the liver and their dysfunction. So that's going to be where I'm going to go further with this. And finally, this brings up the idea of what in the Western tradition is known as tissue states. In Chinese medicine, it's known as pattern differentiation. Um, but we can have different patterns um, in the terrain based on the balance of these different activities. So, um, for example, we can have in the metabolic uh, activities, again, too much heat or too much cold. So an excess will be what we call a yang excess state in Chinese medicine or in the Western traditions. And this is specifically in what is called physiomedicalism. This was in the 1900s. It was an herbal tradition um, that uh, discussed tissue states. They try to combine more traditional herbal thinking with the emerging ideas in physiology. Uh, Matthew Wood is an herbalist who has really done a lot to sort of resurrect this way of thinking uh, within the herbal field. So it's very be good to, if you're interested more in that, you can Google his name with physiomedicalism. There's some interesting articles that come up and he's written several books as well. Um, so we can have excess metabolism, heat irritation state, that'd be with redness and then maybe fever and, and swelling and so forth. And then a deficiency state, yang deficiency, more coldness uh, in the tissue or organ where there's less circulation, less metabolic activity. Currently we're discussing these in the biomedical mechanistic context as mitochondrial dysfunction, for example, not making enough energy and warmth, um, as well as potentially endothelial dysfunction. Endothelial cells line your capillaries and your blood vessels, and when they're not able to function properly, we don't get the right blood flow into an area. Um, the second state here would be autonomic nerve activity, and this is going to vary by organs. Some organs are more innervated by the sympathetics, like the heart, and then others are more innervated by the parasympathetics, like your digestive system. So I'm talking about autonomic just on or off as a whole, not so much sympathetic or parasympathetic here. So an excess sympathetic state in the heart would be constriction, um, or what is called tension or wind um, in the traditional medicines. Um, and this would be, for example, palpitations, uh, um, maybe a more rapid heart rate, feeling of actual constriction in the chest and so forth. Versus in the gut, we'd have overactive vagus activity or, or enteric nervous system activity. And there we would have uh, too much cramping, uh, again, nausea, maybe diarrhea and so forth, or tense gut. Then we can have, on the other hand, relaxation or hateny uh, in the Western tradition. So here's the excess, and then here we have more the uh, relaxed state. Um, and that would be lack of nerve innervation, uh, proper innervation in that tissue. 
In the case of tissue fluids or yin, we can have an excess, which would be known as dampness or phlegm uh, in the traditional uh, medicines. The, you can have different types of dampness, more of a thin dampness or more of a thick dampness. Uh, so there's differentiations even within that. And then you can have a dryness state where organs like the liver, when they become cirrhose, they almost become hardened and dried out. You can see that in muscles that have been chronically injured as well. Um, and then circulation in the blood, we can have uh, what is called stasis. And that's essentially where we get too much clotting, we get too much uh, uh, these clotting factors and all and whatnot, um, you know, sort of block the circulation, but it's almost an excess of these clotting elements and, and whatnot, uh, as well as endothelial dysfunction. And then we can have a deficiency and that results in an atrophy of the tissues that are nourished. So for example, anemia states, but also general deficiencies, the liver doesn't put out enough protein or another, uh, other things, we can start getting problems in the downstream organs. So these are, we might call the eight tissue states uh, and can represent them as a map like this as colors. So we can talk about, for example, the uh, Yang excess state is orange, Yang deficiency state is more blue, we can talk about the uh, more chi constriction state is too much yellow. Chi deficiency state is more violet. Uh, damp state is being more green. And then magenta is the opposite. And then the red-blue axis representing the blood states or arterial stasis here, more venous uh, on this side. So this provides a map of terrain, which we can then develop and start to look at each organ, for example, as having different terrain states. So when, for example, uh, remedies, natural remedies are applied to the liver. Often we just talk about the liver as a whole, um, but we can start to differentiate. There's potential liver heat states, uh, which would need certain uh, remedies that are more cooling. Uh, similarly, there are more cold states that need more warming remedies. There are more states where we need to stimulate the vagal activity and bile flow. We need to stimulate the yellow, and then other cases maybe relax. And so we can start to see within a, a given organ several sub patterns that require different types of therapies uh, to balance. And that's what I want to get into in the future lectures is look at each organ system and the sub patterns there that come out. So, but this is a sort of starting place for looking at overall tissue states, which are again, pictures of the state of the extracellular matrix, but it's where all the fields come together uh, and uh, we can see them working as a whole. And this is essentially, again, what the ancient Greeks called the vis medicatrix naturae, the forces that work at this level to, they're trying, trying to rebalance. Um, and we can, in, in clinical practice, you know, people that are more in integrative salutogenic medicine can work to try to rebalance these different forces, again, using natural products, which I'll, I'll speak more about, um, and uh, through also diet and lifestyle and exercise and so forth. So a little introduction to tissue states. Uh, I'll end this, this lecture here, but thank you for listening. And um, again, like the video and subscribe if you like this content so I can, you know, I'm inspired to make more of these. And um, there's a lot more that can be discussed in terms of specific remedies and uh, maybe some of the integrating more of the traditional uses with the modern uh, research findings, um, as well as maybe new perspectives on herbal medicine. We can look at herbs as actually combining all these different activities as well and that each herb can have a specific effect on specific organs at regulating the different tissue states uh, so i can say much more about that so anyways i'll end this here and uh, thank you very much for listening